The world of Ionios has gotten a beautiful, but sometimes very disturbing, 24 minute presentation as Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is set to release on July 29 of this year. Hey everyone, it's Yggdrasil and welcome back to another Xenoblade Chronicles 3 analysis video. With so much new information, we have quite a lengthy discussion ahead of us because I am here to talk about every single key takeaway that I took from the Xenoblade 3 Direct. And I do mean just about everything, barring the usual references to Saga and Gears, as I haven't played those games and I do not feel qualified to give any parallels justice. Aside from some bare bones references, I'd highly recommend checking up with content creators like NL or Luxon for those kinds of things. Aside from that, I did mean everything, including anything that a general viewer may well consider a spoiler. Saying this, I encourage you that if you want to play the game as blind as possible, this is not the video for you. I will also be alluding to things that have taken place in both Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and 2, so spoilers for those games are going to be brought up as well. Also, a lot of the info I'm going to present will be jumping around from different parts of the Direct of what was shown, so it won't exactly be as linearly presented, but I'll try and make things as smooth as possible. Lastly, if I haven't already shooed you away somehow from this video and you end up enjoying it, enjoy my analysis or enjoy what I have to say in general, please consider subscribing to my channel and letting me know what you think in the comments below. I also happen to have a Twitter that you can follow me there where I talk about many different games on an almost daily basis. With all that being said, we got a lot of things to talk about so let's get right into it. Right before we start going at things piece by piece, I want to bring up this new and updated affinity chart translated by Magpie on Twitter and shared by the unofficial Xenoblade English page. While many of the things with the main party seem to be the same, new characters have appeared on both main faction sides. The biggest takeaway from this update, as you may have noticed however, is this new upper faction with a red border, the Consul, leader of both nations. I'm going to explain this in the first upcoming detail, but there is one other key takeaway. That is, we do not have three factions shown here we actually have four. Vandom is outside the grid, a purposefully and beautifully executed action done to highlight that he actually really is off the grid. It turns out that Vandom's a part of a fourth faction called the Lost Numbers, a group of defectors who managed to escape the chaos of the war and set up a city around the land by the Mechonis' sword called Sword March. This info will be covered as we roll things along, so let's jump right in. We first start off with a new 3 minute trailer titled in the UK version as the Passage of Fate trailer, yet again another nod to that ominous line from our mysterious giant fiend. And it turns out we actually lead off with our friend, who the community has come to call Mr. Wild Ride, returning to a hidden base made inside a rather fancy looking theater. As he's chastised by a woman in peculiar armor, he suddenly comes out of form, revealing he's not one but two unique individuals. It turns out one person who made up Mr. Wild Ride, or perhaps his codename is simply the letter D, while the woman in the jester armor behind him is not yet known or named. The woman scolding him is identified with the letter P. And then we have many other similarly dressed individuals coming into the light, all of them raring to go after our newly paired up party. And then all of them are just mocked absolutely and outright by who I assume is their superior, a man who we barely get to see at all save for his long hair, a little bit of his lightly glowing robes, and uh, oh yeah, giant purple scars across his cheeks, and flowing purple energy horns, of course. No clue who this guy is, but he's seemingly a leader in our newly introduced mystery group. There's already some early theories popping up that he may be a failed experiment in the time before Claws rewrote the universe. All of these characters are the Consuls. These masked third faction members are noted by their distinct uniforms and have infinity shaped Ouroboros marks in place of the single circle ones that common soldiers have for their flame clocks. They can forcibly extract the flames of life or the life energy that soldiers have stored in their flame clocks be it from the soldiers directly or through the machines of war, and use it for themselves. More on this in the next segment. And just to show off how prominent this faction is going to be, the affinity chart purposely stated that these guys directly control and influence the affairs of both Kevis and Agnes, 
and the state of the world itself even having their own castles in the territories of both factions. And I truly mean they control the way the world is. These guys have access to facilities where soldiers are literally grown for the purpose of war. According to Tyon, they're supposed to have a role in delivering missives directly from the queens, as well as handling administrative and some decision-making policies. Even colony generals like Ethel must take and follow orders from them. It's clear that they are doing much more than what Tyon has heard. For one, their forms, which the fanbase thought were other Ouroboros, are actually a new type of being called Mobius. The Mobius units and the console's armor design are giving many people who have played Xenogears immediate references. After all, Monolith Soft has wanted to tell their story for almost 25 years, and now it's finally been given a chance to be expressed through the Xenoly Chronicles trilogy. Another new character that I want to talk about with the consoles here is this man shown right here. Only seen very briefly in the trailer, he seems to be in the same room that the consoles met earlier, and his hairstyle and eye color, and even the sword itself in his artwork, greatly resembles Noah. Many people, myself included, believe that this could be a clone of our main protagonist. If growing soldiers in a facility is the norm in this world, technology for cloning is extremely likely to also exist. To that extent, this unnamed figure is being dubbed Noah Alter, or as I like to say more simply, No Alter. As for the rest of our masked console cast, we have no way of knowing what lies beneath the masks so far, but I have been seeing a few theories pop up already. The most prominent theory is that, given the existence of a person who looks eerily similar to Noah, the rest of the console members are clones of the rest of the cast. This is only reinforced by the fact that D and the Jester theme console have the exact same eye colors as Lans and Senna, thus they can transform into their version of an Ouroboros-like being, the Mobius. An offshoot of this theory suggests that the Jester console is actually a clone of Uni, given that perhaps the wings could be hidden using the sides of the headpiece. The last main theory circulating believes that the console could actually be members of the main casts of both Xenoid 1 and 2, and are working with their respective queens to keep the state of the world as is, for whatever reason. Lastly, with the consoles, you can see purple motes of light dissipate as each of them leave their little stage meeting. This is perhaps one of the only references we were shown in the direct, potentially relating to the fog beasts introduced in Future Connected. Perhaps, as Melia put it, the fog beasts were but an ill premonition to the real threat, these beings calling themselves the consoles. We'll just have to see. Moving on, we have a rather phased and agitated Noah feeling distraught after a hard-fought battle, standing over the bodies of his slain enemies. He explains to us that soldiers are given a lifespan of 10 years, and each year is called a term. On top of the flame clocks inserted into each soldier's eye, every soldier is also born with a tattoo, glowing bright red and then fading to black as the years roll on by. If a soldier lives through their full 10 terms, then they present themselves to their queen, who in a homecoming ceremony will honor their service by ascending them to heaven personally said to be the highest honor that a soldier would receive. This is the part of the direct that honestly terrified me the most. If this really is Melia and she isn't seemingly controlled by the red eyes that the consuls are influencing the generals with, she literally just is sacrificing one of her own soldiers in this video. This is a mind-boggling juxtaposition of Melia's character. From the first time we met Melia at the very start of Magna Forest back in Xenoblade Chronicles 1, where she begged the soldiers tasked to guard her not to sacrifice their lives for her sake, we now have her character willingly sacrifice people she otherwise had sworn to protect at the end of Future Connected. It almost makes me wish that this isn't Melia, maybe another potential example of a clone or that she's not acting of her own volition, because if it really is her, I would feel absolutely torn for her character. Speaking of torn for characters, Mio herself was known to be about a year older than the rest of our party, and it turns out, according to Vandom, she has just about three months to go before her tenth term is completed, and she will have to present herself to the Agnes Queen, presumably to die. But what about the soldiers who don't make it to their tenth term? Many in reality won't, and their life energy would otherwise go to waste. Cue the Feranis. These are the colony-class weaponry that I alluded to in previous videos, but we now know that they are called Feranus by both factions. 
It's crazy how psyched I was seeing that the Colony 9 Furanus was inspired by Metal Face's design, and it was going to be fighting for the Xenoblade Chronicles 1 team, and now I'm actually just as terrified of it as the first time I saw Metal Face all those years ago. Here's why. If a soldier dies in battle, their life energy is directed to and collected by the Furanus of the opposing faction. In a post by Xenoblade JP, it turns out that if a Furanus is destroyed, or if the Furanus' flame clock runs out during the fight, the soldiers of that Furanus' faction will also die along with it. In essence, this forces the soldiers to give it their all for the sake of just surviving, living in order to fight, and fighting in order to live, exactly as Noah stated in the first trailer. This means that all battles in Ionios will only end when the other faction's forces are completely decimated. Whether the life energy of the Fallen is collected for future use, or used as a part of their energy for combat is unknown, but this is just an absolutely gruesome way to go, and many soldiers after a few years experience will come to realize that their lives feel worthless or discardable as a result. Many of the characters who come to feel this way end up developing trauma from the war, Tyon himself fearful of each day that passes, wondering if the people in his life will be gone the next day or if he'll even be around at that point, even developing tremors sometimes when he wakes up and remembers his life. And the only way that the Fallen are remembered is through the role of the Offseer, a unique role given to specific members of each army. As we know, an Offseer's duty is to honor those who have fallen in battle, seemingly in place of the Queen. Unlike the red motes of life energy that are forcibly extracted by either the Consuls or the Pharaonis, or the golden motes of light ceremoniously ascended by the Queen, these are the blue motes that we've been seeing since the very first trailer clip, and perhaps represent that their life energy goes back into the land and isn't absorbed by either faction. What is something that is very important to note here, however, is that Offseers override the colors of the life energy when they perform. In the direct trailer, you can see the golden motes around Noah and Mio, but they begin to fade and are replaced by blue motes as they continue to play. This is also the same scene as the ending clip in the second trailer, where they are fully surrounded by blue motes. There's also a second confirmation that was released on June 28, showing the group coming across some soldiers that were killed in an earlier confrontation, the red motes of life still emanating from their bodies. By honoring them, the red motes faded and became blue offseer motes. I know I'm talking and putting so much emphasis on the colors of this life energy, but the distinct decision for different colors with these motes of light is a clear sign that symbolizes or means something. Perhaps the blue life energy could well be something as simple as returning to the earth, or something maybe a little more complex, it's just something we'll have to see as we learn more and more. The trailer rolls on as our party is just trying to run, and they're confronted by Kevesian soldiers. Up until this point, we saw the red eyes appearing only on the generals of both factions, but it seems that the consuls are able to directly control people into following whatever order they hand out. Several soldiers, all with their flame clocks glowing red, confront the group, and a consul member walks among them as we get a glimpse of a new Mobius form. This is the scene where we can see the Mobius use what I presume is Ethel's Pharaonus to forcibly extract the life energy out of the soldiers he had mind controlled. What's also important in this scene, this is where we will also see Noah pull out the main blade from his weapon and go full samurai mode, grabbing a hold of Mio while in the air and lunging straight at the flame clock of the Pharaonus, slashing it in half. Now, as I mentioned earlier, doing this would kill the soldiers attached to the Pharaonus, but if it's only about the people engaged in battle alongside the Phronis itself, and the other soldiers were already sacrificed, well, that just leaves the Mobius itself. It'll be interesting to see if consuls abide by the rules they themselves set up, and we're gonna have a consul member die off early as a warning to the rest of the members that they need to stop fooling around. If that's the case, then this enemy could well be the Zord of Xenoblade Chronicles 3. As the initial trailer goes through some scenes showing off our friends bonding and discussing Mio's remaining lifespan, we then get some more battle shots, but then a very interesting clip shows up. Two console members enter a laboratory, and while it may not seem like anything too important, the detail is in the location itself. This is undoubtedly the Great Hall in Alchemoth. In the first part we can see a long pathway lined up with several high-entian hologram displays, and there are small fountains along each side. 
On the second part, you can see that there is a slight incline with platforms on both sides. There are these pod-like machines hugging the walls, and the central platform where a third figure is observing someone on a hologram display is where the portrayal of the battle between Bionis and Mechanus was inscribed. All of this fits perfectly well with the layout of the Great Hall, and again, it absolutely terrifies me that the last images of Alchemoth that we saw in Future Connected fully rebuilt, people cheering and happy, Melia and Tyrea walking from this hall itself towards a new unknown future, and this is what the future has become. I mentioned a third figure, and while it's a little hard to see, the golden legwear gives it away that it is our friend, who suspiciously looks a lot like Noah. And those pods, as it turns out, are where soldiers, as our Mobius character pointed out, are growing. So all soldiers, or perhaps almost all people in this world, are seemingly grown in pods for the purpose of perpetuating the war. This goes to great lengths to explaining why all the different races in both games are the same age and yet all look to be similarly developed. In some manner, all the races are being grown together in these labs in a way that they are all at the same stage of development suitable for fighting, regardless of their race's respective lifespans. It explains why a mixed blood high Entia, or even a Machina like Lance, could have the same age as someone like Noah, and even why Machina appear so strikingly different compared to how they were in the past. We then hear, the Lost Numbers are attacking, and I explained before that they are the group that Vandom either leads or is a part of. This clip seems to indicate a multitude of airborne ships going in to strike a city or a large building, and it seems we may have a little bit more info about this faction to share. We have a small clip of Lance getting absolutely thrashed by a rather young girl with an almost Urian accent, wielding what looks like fist or gauntlet weapons, and she's accompanied by two men behind her. I've come to the assumption that these men gouged out or deactivated the flame clocks in their eyes in some way, because the scars appear to be either fresh or perhaps it's covered in a blood red war paint, but they don't appear to be blinded from messing with their flame clocks. There's also a theory about the girl, suggesting that she may actually be Vandom's daughter and the truly first natural-born human in Ionios since the war began. It makes some amount of sense. Vandom is the oldest known non-console, non-queen character that we've seen so far, and even the two men behind this girl appear somewhat older than the standard NPCs we're going to be seeing. The next clip shows a new unnamed character smiling moments before getting crushed by debris. Rest in peace, buddy. We see him later on in a segment where all of our Kavessian soldiers are being trained, and his age and the setting in this cutscene suggests that he died in the Agnian attack on Colony 9, where Ethel saved Noah and the rest of his friends. Looks like she missed one, huh? Well, there's a popular theory going around that, given the kid's bulky stature and the fact that we didn't technically see him die, he may actually be this large, hefty console member seen here. I always say that unless a character is absolutely obliterated on screen for the player to see, there's always a chance they didn't actually die. I mean, heck, Rex was stabbed through the heart, but, uh, you know, he has main character privileges, so, you know, he's fine. We'll just have to see with this kid. Another clip shows Noah's Ouroboros fighting what appears to be a Kavessian mech. If you remember the release date trailer, we know that this is actually Ethel's. The area they're fighting in has some seemingly more than ruins, so perhaps they're fighting along the entrance to the Mac the Wildwoods as they escape from Aegis Wilderness, maybe Ethel chased them. There's also this small snippet of Noah being able to use his gauntlet to shoot out an energy blast. I want to point some attention to this because there's some speculation that the gauntlet's color scheme and design closely resembles console armor. I really don't know too much of what to make about this info, it's just something that was pointed out, and we'll just have to see how this could all tie into, or how Noah even knows that he can shoot energy beams from the gauntlet in the first place. For all we know, Noah may have been using his sword and gauntlet like this for some time prior to the events of the game. Following a scene of Lan's as Ouroboros uppercutting a dragon-like creature, we have who I presume to be Manana yelling, the Annihilator started moving, as a giant beam begins to charge from this colony. Except, it's not a colony. That's the outer ring of Alchemoth, with a new giant weapon strung up to it. And what's even more crazy is that we saw Alchemoth since the reveal trailer back in February, but we couldn't even make it out given what we saw on screen. With the images we've gotten from the direct trailer, we can see here that these are actually the floating rock-like formations from the first trailer, and then here, when the Annihilator weapon is starting to fire, 
you can see the large central spire comprising the Imperial Palace, along with some adjacent circular chambers. In this sequence of cutscenes, we also catch a glimpse of Ethel looking at the main hologram in the Great Hall, as she's surrounded by several of the pods. She doesn't appear to have the red eye mind control from the consoles, and looks away from the blast as it fires. I've been speculating that this may be a scene where, after learning more about the consoles and their plans, she is brought to the lab to witness the Annihilator weapon take out either dissidents or perhaps even possibly civilians. If so, this could be when Ethel begins to truly contemplate defecting from Kevas and would get away from the consoles. That's my personal theory anyway. What is a strong contrast to the series is that we actually then hear Riku saying, This is bad, Noah, in the most Chad voice I swear a upon has ever had, and I am 100% convinced it's Patrick Sates voicing him. Truly, the Chad upon has come to save us all. Okay, for real though, it seems that Riku and Manana are at Alchemoth during all of this, given the platform's layout. It'll be interesting to see if maybe our group learns that the consoles or the Queen is planning something with the Annihilator and we're here to stop it. We then get a few scenes where Mio iterates that she has found a new purpose for living and then the voice of Senna encourages her to not give up and that she wants to give something to Mio to buy her a little extra time. Mio, looking on supposedly at Senna doing something in her Ouroboros form, begs her to stop, that she doesn't want any of her time. This whole deal gets even crazier when we see Yuni's Ouroboros in combat, surrounded by a bunch of Agnian weaponry, but she's actually fighting Noah's Ouroboros. Noah and Mio make statements lamenting the state of the world, that Noah will literally end the world if it keeps holding back people's lives, and that Mio is sick of people's lives being toyed with, that they're not just some toys to be played with. And then there's this angry purple fella. He's fighting Mio's Ouroboros form. Yeah, that's right, you heard me. Her Ouroboros form. There's new Ouroboros forms in this trailer that I'm going to get into later in the video. But you'd think then that this guy's clearly a Mobius. However, it's an Ouroboros. Blowing down this clip, we can get a brief look at the circular orb that the Ouroboros and Mobius units have. And this is clearly an Ouroboros circle. No clue about who it may be in there, but with it seemingly going crazy, could one of our party members have been hijacked? We did just see Noah and Yuni's Ouroboroses fighting one another after all. If not, maybe it's a new set of players on the field. There are also some suggesting that it could be the purple scarred character we saw back at the beginning of the trailer, and somehow he can use both Mobius and Ouroboros forms. But as always, that's just something we're going to have to wait for and see. And with that, the Passage of Fate trailer has concluded, but boy, are we far from over. We still have around 20 minutes to go, mind you. Alright, alright, I'm trying not to be as super nitpicky as I was with the main trailer, and instead I'm going to use this time to go over everything in segments similar to how I portrayed my last Xenoblade video. So let's begin like last time with locations. Now, I expected maybe one or two new locations, but we got a whole plethora of new zones revealed to us, including some of their names. From the snowy Capricorn Peak, to the Sierra Hovering Reefs where Alchemoth is located, to the base of the Great Sword itself. One main zone I'll be particularly interested in is the Erythea Sea, because as its name implies, and similar to areas like the Magtha Wildwood, the Erythea Sea is a merging of the Aerith Sea from Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and the Leftherian Archipelago of Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Two of my absolute most favorite, most gorgeous zones I've come across in any video game. We get footage of this area back in the first trailer too, from swimming alongside monsters to traveling around in a boat. We also have a handful of screenshots from the Japanese website for the game which have a few implications. I want to thank Magpie again for helping me with translating these. The first image implies diving, which was hinted at in the first trailer, and it seems to be a real thing after all, perhaps it'll serve as a field skill. We also have several shots of using a boat to traverse with, which to me resembles one of the Lost Number ships in my opinion from earlier. We also got an image of our group fighting a giant shark monster in the ocean itself. This is going to be the first time in the series that fighting in water that's more than knee deep is going to be a real thing, and it makes me so very excited. No longer will we start a fight only to remember that Ricky is in the party and probably drowning away at the end of the river. No longer will we have to pull the piranhas out to near the shoreline. Ocean fighting is real and I am so very happy for it. Meanwhile we have another zone overlooking a part of the Aegis Wilderness. 
This place is actually called the Forerunner's Tower in the Ray Bell Tableland. Quite a confusing name, honestly. Now, while this is a very beautiful scene, it's important to note in the bottom left-hand side, you can see that there is an open space below. This makes me bring up the question, how much of the open world is floating, or is it that in some biomes, because of the Titan origins of the world, they tend to have naturally high inclines as a result? We have a few other zones that I also really want to talk about, specifically a few returning ones. We have zones such as Melnath's Shoulder, a location in Xenoblade Chronicles 2 that alluded to the Gormati Titan's actual name. Speaking of actual Titan names, we also got a clip of one zone in a place called the Orion Tunnels, specifically the ruins of Cebu. If this is a naming style similar to the Melnath one, we could very well have just learned that the Orion Titan's real name is Cebu. Another returning place you may recall is the distant fingertip located from the fallen arm of Xenoblade 1, sitting somewhere in the Aegis Wilderness. Well, that area in specific has been termed the Elais Highway, but something even more cool is that the specific zone on the fingertip is called Zane's Talon. If the name rings a bell to Xenoblade 1 fans, it's because Zane was the name of a high Entian adventurer who, with his partner Kuralth, went on an expedition in Valak Mountain, but they ended up horribly stranded. It's interesting to see that his name is brought up here, maybe after their misadventure they traveled around and found some new places to name after themselves. The last special location that I want to bring up is a very special one because I brought this location up several times due to extreme similarities to its Tornin location. And sure enough, the Danag Desert, no name changes at all, is somehow in the world of Ionios. As if Moritha weren't already enough to confirm that the world merged beyond just what the events of Xenoblade 2 implied, now we have a full desert region from a titan that has been decaying for over 500 years, and it is as pristine as it was back in Torn of the Golden Country. So now that we talked about some new locations, let's talk about some overworld features. On top of swimming and diving as a potential new field mechanic, we may have also seen another new field skill. We got one clip that showed the party following monster tracks, so perhaps as someone who lives in the Maktha Wildwoods, maybe Juniper could be the one to teach us to track specific enemies. There is another thing of interest in the overworld, and that is our characters are going towards a supply drop in this clip. What's interesting to me here that may differentiate the supply drop from a standard treasure chest is the fact that the supply drop is still smoking very fresh. It makes me wonder if our party could perhaps intercept military supplies for random suitable rewards, or perhaps this is an example of a random overworld encounter. Speaking of random overworld encounters, we have something new in this game that'll make the world feel much more alive, and that's the fact that hostile monsters can aggro onto other monster species. We have a scene here of some crust dips battling some brogs, and by pressing ZR it looks like we can engage both enemies at once, perhaps for larger rewards than usual. It's not just monsters either, but the battle for supremacy between Kevis and Agnes will also be raging even as they continue to search for our band of fugitives. It'll be interesting to see how our party will engage in fights between the two factions. From the info I brought up earlier about coming across fallen troops, and honoring them can build reputation with their respective colonies, it'll be interesting to see if intervening in these fights could build reputation with both factions as well. It'd also be pretty funny in my opinion if we enter a fight, kill members of both factions, and then still get reputation anyway for both of them after we pray for the people we just killed, so I really just wonder what those skirmishes could lead to. There's a little more info that I want to bring up shortly, but I also want to quickly just bring up how in this cutscene the Kavessian mechs are using an ability to shield themselves, and it looks incredibly like the Monado shield ability that Shulk used. It's just a lovely touch. There are also a few other features that I want to talk about. Time changing, quest routes, shortcuts, autosave, and the mini-map itself. Both time changing and quest routes were iterated on in previous games, and while changing, the time will be similar, allowing us to confront different enemies or speak to different NPCs and take up new quests based on what time of day or night it is. The quest routes feature looks to be massively improved and streamlined from Xenoblade X and 2. The result is a far more precise quest route than what we've seen in previous games, and I am happy to see that kind of iteration presented in Xenoblade 3. Shortcuts, then, are a new and extremely useful feature to have as well. 
By pressing a button, we can assign the A, B, Y, X buttons each their own shortcut, whether it be accessing maps or quests, swapping out our characters, or activating the quest route that I just talked about. I can only assume there are other shortcuts that we could access based on our personal preferences, and I'm happy to see a personal level of customization. Now with the autosave feature returning to us, regardless of whether these save files will be like 1 or like X and 2, I hope that players have the option to turn off or on autosave as they want. And lastly with the minimap, I just want to point out that on top of the usual icons that we normally see on the minimap, we can see a few new icons. The overworld skirmishes will be given a clashing swords icon, and there are also tombstone icons as well. If you remember from my combat analysis video, tombstones appear when a unique monster is defeated, and activating them will respawn that unique monster. Being able to see the tombstone on the map is a very major thing, considering that in Xenoblade 2, you as the player had to remember exactly where that tombstone was located after beating up the monster for the first time. Alright, now let's talk about colonies. No one in the party will be able to enter colonies and in some way or another try and liberate them from the yoke of both factions. Each colony is guarded by a Pharaonis and their names are identified as numbers for Keves or by Greek letters for Agnes. Many regular town hub features are accessible at these locations. Talking to NPCs, shopping for gear, getting a meal, resting at a campsite, you know, the usual. One thing that I do want to bring up here is the flame clock-like symbol located by the minimap. There are some theories that this is the Pharaonis' flame clock and thus a battle around the colony could ensue shortly if it isn't refueled in some way, or that this is perhaps an indicator showing how much the party has to do in that colony in order to liberate it. I mentioned fighting between the two factions being something prominent in the overworld a short while ago, and from the Nintendo of Japan site for the game, we have an image that states the following when translated. The people of Ionio seek refuge in military colonies, which, once liberated, can become a safe haven for your party too. It'll be a little weird if we have to kill both sides in skirmishes, so I honestly wonder if there's a way our party will enter those fights and stop them from fighting. Perhaps in this way we could build trust in adjacent colonies and slowly spread the word about the war. In turn, this may allow us to begin liberating colonies one by one and expand on what our party members can do in each colony. The last bit of the colonies is just that I enjoy the irony in having a Pharaonis resembling Metal Face protecting Colony 9. I mentioned campsites as a town hub feature, so I'd like to talk about that now as well. Whether on the road by a fireplace or at a campsite in or right by a colony, campsite gatherings will have quite a lot that our party can do from engaging in chat with one another, cooking, gem crafting, and even getting new quests if we talk to a specific NPC while on the road, there's no reason not to ever stop by a campfire if you get the chance. Plus, and I want to be absolutely very clear here, I love all of the heart and soul dedicated into the campfire system. Character banter, good quality food that's not PS2 era, and animations that just show our crew having many different kinds of moments together are easily a part of the reason that I will grow heavily attached to our group. When characters are allowed to bond more naturally than simply traveling from point A to point B, that is when I bond with them all the more. It's those moments where characters drop a lot of the heavy dialogue and just have honest to goodness chats or moments of camaraderie that allow the cast to gain so much more vibrancy and appeal. At least, that's how I feel on the matter. Regardless, in such a dark and grisly world, it'll be very nice to have these moments of brevity where our crew can just goof around and relax. Now before we get into the new combat info, I very quickly just want to cover up the last bits of the overworld and many things we were shown. I brought up shopping when we were talking about the colonies, so let's start there. We got one quick glimpse of what the shop UI looks like. The shop interface shows accessories such as hats, wrist pieces, necklaces, and shoes. Item rarity has three tiers, likely affecting the value of the buff that they bear, like with Xenoblade 2. It also seems that, based on the equipable icon, not everyone uses the exact same gear. It'll be interesting to see if some gear is specifically gender locked, or locked to a specific faction. One last thing to point out here are the currencies on the top right. We all know about gold, but we can also see both gold and silver Nopon coins, and also usable ether cylinders. 
These were items that we saw used in gem crafting, but its appearance in the shop UI could indicate we may come across shops that deal specifically with those currencies as well. The next thing I want to talk about is the return of the affinity chart. These charts are updated every time you talk to a uniquely named NPC, and if two NPCs know one another, a bond is shown indicating the relationship between the two. We are able to see the name of the NPC, what term they are in, and what colony they seem to be from. It's also important to note that in the bottom, we can see that there are buttons for each NPC wanting specific items, and the profile can be toggled on and off. I also want to point out here that by pressing Y, we will swap to a Collectopedia card, indicating that the Collectopedia tab is returning to us. It was a system back in Xenoly Chronicles 1, where we would collect all of the items from each zone and put them in their own respective chart. Filling each tab would give us rewards like gear, weapons, and gems, so it'll be interesting to see what we will be given in this game if it plays similarly. All I ask is please just no nightmare spawns like fossil monkeys or black liver beans, please that's all I ask. Something else I'd like to point out with the affinity chart is that it also shows the hero characters that we will come across in the game. We can see Zeon here having a trusting relationship with Juniper. A little surprising, maybe this will indicate something between the two as the factions grow closer as the game progresses. And Zeon is listed in his 10th term. Rip sword and board, man. In this image, we also see Valdi having a link to a rather wonky looking machine NPC. Maybe a personal creation of theirs. Other hero units are also shown who I'm going to introduce shortly. Also with the affinity chart is that we can see other examples of high Entians having wing colors matching their hair colors. Not only that, but the character being selected on the chart right now, Ryza of Colony Iota, is the first confirmation of a Orion to appear in this game, denoted by the scales on their cheeks. So at the very least, we know the Orions live on in some way in the world of Ionios, and they weren't completely eradicated when the Orion Titan was cleaved in two. The very last thing I want to bring up with the affinity chart, and this is what scares me the most, is the fact that we have an affinity chart that looks a lot like ones, because if anyone remembers the very obvious core event in Xenoblade Chronicles 1, you will remember just how many characters and NPCs were affected by those events. And now that we have heroes listed on that chart, it makes me all the more worried we will see some people unfortunately leave us. I don't know how that will influence gameplay, considering we're meant to be using the heroes as our 7th party members, but it's just something that I have to think about and worry about, and now you do too. <laughs> Alright, now it's finally time to talk about combat-centric things, and we have several things to talk about, from new characters, to classes, to even more about our own Ouroboros forms, so let's get right into it. First up, we have hard confirmation of all of the things that our tactics menu in combat will be. Think of it as giving our AI-controlled party members priorities in combat to focus on, and we can see from each name and their icon what they will be like. We have two of the main orders that we have always been used to, focus attacks on a single enemy, and follow the leader, which is going to stop the AI from fighting until you give a new order. But we have two new orders this time around to give. Fusion first implies that we can order our allies to prioritize their fusion art attacks in combat, but the real big one is any combo. Note that the icon for smash is here as well as the icon for burst, a new part of the combo chain that I'll talk about shortly. The any combo button will look to have the AI prioritize combos above all else, and this is easily one of the better quality of life combat changes that we've seen in this game. Think of it, every time you put break on the enemy is shulk, and then Ryan just never bothers to topple. Think of all the times you waited on Tora to topple the enemy in time for a fusion, and then he just swaps out Poppy into another mode that can't follow up. No more my friends, we have it, the power's in our hands. Now obviously this override can only do so much based on cooldowns. It's not quite foolproof, but it is nice to know that the AI can be set to prioritize combos a little more, and I guarantee you that this is an order that I will be using on most, if not all of my fights, for sure. Since we're on the topic of combos, let's talk about them briefly. Not only do we have official confirmation of the return of Break, Topple, Launch, Smash, but like I just mentioned, we have a new combo in the form of Burst, which is going to be following Days. 
While we don't know what it does quite just yet, the ether defense down and the resist on screen are from different abilities, the animation ends off with the mob bursting, or rather blasted up into the air for a time. It'll be interesting to see what kind of situation people would end up preferring burst for over smash, if smash's rewards are similar to how they were in 2. It's just something that we're gonna have to see for ourselves. And speaking of seeing for ourselves, we finally saw our very first official footage of what character swapping will look like in combat. While holding the tactics button, you can see that pressing L or R here will change your character out to the one adjacent to it on the character portraits. It's important to note here that arts don't reset on switching out your controlled character. You can see here Uni only has group heal at the ready when we swap to her, with her talent art being unusable, as compared to Mio having her talent art and a different button ability ready to go. I feel that this is pretty fair considering that character swaps would otherwise potentially have been abusive. Next up, we're not only going to talk about the classes, but also brand new characters. I could technically have done this earlier, but because every new character alludes to a new class for combat, I felt it better to fit that here instead together. You may remember in my previous video that hero units will unlock things for us like field skills. Well, it turns out they're also going to unlock new classes for our party to use. This is going to make up for the fact that hero units, while you can have them join your journey as the 7th party member, well, they can't actually be controlled by the player themselves, barring potentially joining on in chain attacks. My earnest hope is that maybe we can play them ourselves in New Game Plus or in some sort of patch later on, we'll just have to see for that. But with that being said, it was posted on the Nintendo website for the game that you can unlock a hero's class by completing their associated questline very similar to how side characters were unlocked in Xenoblade Chronicles X. You may have also spotted in this image that Ethel is shown as a hero unit, and while we had just had that one very hard to see spoiler of Senna using dual blades in combat, this is seemingly just hard confirmation that we're going to get to use Ethel's class at some point, ergo Ethel will be a hero unit. This was unfortunately redacted about a day later by Nintendo. Spoiling information through Keva's units is just apparently an unfortunate trend by the look of things. So how many classes do we know about so far? Well, on top of the main six classes our party starts out with, we don't have just a couple of additional classes. Oh boy, no. We got a whole 19 additional classes so far. That's right. 19 classes, each of them coming with a new character that's going to join the fray. It remains to be seen if all the hero units are related to the main story, or if some will be accessible after doing specific side quests, but I, for one, am more than happy to see such a weapon diversity in this game. It feels as though the blade system of Xenoblade 2 was replaced with the class system, minus all the random gotcha that plagued the preceding title and made it egregious to some players. With the image shown here, the class menu displays 23 units so far, some hidden away with silhouettes, indicating that they could potentially be accessible at that point in the game. Of the silhouettes seen here, some are suggesting this one to resemble the Lost Numbers Gauntlet Girl, this one potentially showing off Kamaravi, and this one, while unknown, looks very Mechon or Machina-like. Some people think it looks very similar to the mysterious raider mob that the group is fighting here. There's a few other things I want to unpack while we have this image of the class selection up. Starting right here at the top, we can see the name of the class with a ranking of how each class adheres to each role. It's clear that the sword is offense, the shield is defense, and heart is for healing. If I had to guess as to what the chess piece could indicate, I would assume it to perhaps be utility, maybe things like the ability to contribute to combos or debuffing the opponent. The rank is nothing we already don't know, as class XP is going to be earned alongside regular character EXP, but then we get master skills, which is something that we haven't seen before. This implies that a skill tree or some sort of menu where we could activate these skills we learn as we reach certain class levels exists. It makes me think that we could eventually mix and match these mastered skills to truly create some ridiculous combat options later on in the game. Master Arts are the other arts that, once you acquire, can be used on a different class on the left side art palette. These abilities then are also what is used during Fusion Arts. Sure enough, as I presumed in my combat video, using a Fusion Art is going to combine the effects of both abilities at once, while using the animation of the art on the right arts palette. 
The last thing I want to go over quickly talking about this menu is note the gold and silver Nopon coins in the upper right, paired with the use Nopon coins button noted in the bottom. It seems that perhaps we can use Nopon coins in some way in this menu, maybe perhaps increasing your class rank just a little bit faster, or there's yet another thing we can unlock in this menu through using these coins. In any case, it makes me glad that they're going to be sticking to a handful of universal currencies that are going to be used in a plethora of shops and menus. I spent quite a lot of time talking about these classes, so now let's finally talk about the characters who are going to bring their skills to life. We have been shown several new characters and confirmations made in this direct. With the characters already known to us, we know Valdi's class is War Medic, a healer. Zeon is a defender, a guardian commander. Riku and Manana are an attacker called a Yumsmith, and Juniper is an attacker known as a Stalker. So now it's time to introduce the new characters shown. We have the Undying Blade Ashura of Kevis, a defender using the Lone Exile class. A defensive, dual-sided blade wielder that looks to have just as strong an offense as she has defense. Alexandria, then, is an attacker from Agnes known as an Incursor, using a great sword not unlike that of the mighty Zekanators to do massive damage, gaining more power in situation like in chain attacks. Gray here is a dual gunner attacker known as a Full Metal Jaguar, a nod to Elma from Xenoblade Chronicles X who has the same class type. I want to point out here that Grey is not listed on the affinity chart that I brought up way back in the start of the video. I personally think that Grey may actually be a soldier of the Lost Numbers who defected from the Kevis faction. Maybe he uses that eye patch of his to hide his gouged out flame clock. It could also explain why his gear is seemingly Kevis color schemed, but he doesn't use any of the Shulk Machina tech on his person. We also were introduced to Fiona, who wields this staff with a flag attached to it and is listed with the healer icon, although her exact class name is unknown. In addition to all these units, we also caught a glimpse of two other characters, a Machina woman who we have no clue as to what her class may be, and an Indoline man who looks to be wielding a staff. This fellow, much like how Ryza was our first confirmation of a Urion, is going to be the first confirmation of an Indoline in this game, which speaks volumes since the vast majority of the Indoline people were killed or went missing, only a handful of ships evacuating refugees to other titans during the events of Ascending the World Tree in Xenoblade 2. Well, all this still leaves a handful of unknown slots, but we already know Ethel's class is going to be accessible at some point. We also caught a clip of Uni using a mastered arc from a class that wielded dual fans, much like everyone's favorite Tornin fella Mikhail. The only other characters that we know of that have weapons are Lost Numbers Gauntlet Girl and Isurd with his light tonfa like fist weapons. But as I said, there are even more classes confirmed than what we've seen here. One additional note here, I would really love to thank the Alien Zombie on the Xenoblade Chronicles Reddit for compiling this chart that shows all of the known class information and who we have to come across in the story to unlock them. Now this is also a good time to talk about gear, and no, I don't mean in terms of stats, but in fashion. Our characters are going to be able to change their gear to be more closely based off of the original class's wielder. It's something we've already seen before. Now, even if you aren't using the class at the time, we have been confirmed that you can still wear the gear of that class with some sort of cosmetic fashion overlay. And it doesn't seem that there is any form of restriction with using the same class on all your party members. The Google Translate meme of six Noahs actually ended up being real and I'm 100% down with it. And while I'm a little sad that we can't mix and match the different designs, hey, that's still at least 26 different design choices for each member of our party if we include both their military and casual clothes. 27 for Noah and Mio if we count their fancy offseer garbs. Chain attacks are next on the list, and thank god we finally have a good estimation of what we can expect in this game's iteration on them. By activating a chain attack, we will consume a third of the chain attack gauge on the right hand side. You will then have the choice of selecting who you would like to issue a chain order. The chain order will be successfully issued at the end of the chain attack if the tactical gauge is completely filled up before that point. Each party member seems to contribute a base amount of tactical points if you choose to use them, but you'll also be able to accrue some more points for using abilities that meet certain requirements. 
You can select up to three of the party members to participate in the chain attack by using the portraits in the bottom left to pick who you want, and then you can use one of the abilities set on their right hand art palette in the chain attack. Note that mastered arts are not usable in chain attacks. There is some speculation that if you fail to accumulate all of the tactical points, you can then spend another third of the chain attack gauge to continue the chain attack until you get a full TP bar, and this personally sounds pretty reasonable to me. I'd also like to point out that in this game, you can press the plus button to end a chain attack early. I can't really think of any real reason to do this unless someone like a speedrunner wants to budget their time a little bit better, or maybe if you are at the end game and finishing off an enemy that just doesn't really mean much to you, you don't want to spend too much time on it, end the chain attack early. In any case, I suppose it's a new quality of life feature in its own way, so why the heck not? Lastly, with chain attacks, Ouroboros forms can also participate in issuing chain orders should their order card be selected. These are incredibly powerful orders with a lot of animation, but it seems to include using two Ouroboros forms at once. Now, I alluded to it earlier, but yeah, we do have more than three Ouroboros forms, so let's talk about them. It turns out that an Ouroboros' form is dictated by which member comprising them wants to take the lead. From the way it was presented in the direct trailer, Senna will be the first to try this out, swapping out Lance's defense-oriented Ouroboros for an offensive one. When swapping out who's leading the Ouroboros form, the design changes completely, so when I say something like Noah's Ouroboros or Mio's Ouroboros, I am implying which form is currently being used. Speaking of, Mio's Ouroboros is a defense-oriented one, but it has the unique and special privilege of being this game's Cosmos reference. I mean, look at that, it's such a spitting image, huh? I will say though, as much as I absolutely adore this design, I really have to give it to Tyon's form. It is such a cool design, and I love how the Mondo, the paper-like weapons that he uses in combat, resemble Galaga in this form. Some other things to talk about then, regarding the Ouroboros, is that we now know that their talent art is filled by cancelling attacks. Also, much like how we can swap characters in combat, we also have the ability to switch which Ouroboros form is in control using the left arts palette after interlinking. But those aren't the only new details with the Ouroboros. It turns out that each form has their own skill tree to work towards in the menu. Using soul points, which I assume we will gain as we fight more and more enemies, we can spend these points on new passive buffs and what will look to be either new arts or buffs for specific arts. It looks like only two abilities or passives could be used at a time, and in this image we can only see that one of those is currently usable, so it feels to me like the other may be unlocked over time or after unlocking something specific on the skill tree. There's one very last thing that I want to talk about with regards to combat now that we've covered all of the new things introduced. Using some good old fashioned math, I have calculated a new estimate for the arts and animations within the game. As of right now, we know that with a minimum of 25 classes, there are 5 arts per character, 1 special, 2 in Noah's case, 1 chain attack order, and 3 fusion arts. Multiplied by 25 classes, that gives us 251 class arts and animations. On the Ouroboros side of things, we know that there are three base arts per form, one special, one chain attack order, and multiplied by six, that gives us 30 Ouroboros arts and animations. This means that with the information we know of right now, there are 281 unique arts and animations in the game. Technically 206 if you discount the fact that fusion arts are simply using two arts at once. Like I said in my earlier combat video, this game is going to be absolutely crazy and offer the player so much variance and control in fights that it still sounds and feels just so surreal to me. Definitely looking forward to messing around with everything as soon as the game is out. I absolutely cannot wait. That's almost everything covered, just two more points that I want to quickly bring up. The first is that Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is going to have amiibo functionality. You can tap any of the amiibo you own to give your party some helpful item. Using a Shulk amiibo, however, is going to do something unique. It will unlock a Monado skin for Noah's Sword Fighter class that we can use in combat. It's interesting to see that they used Rex's version of the Monado, dubbed Monado Rex, for this game. It makes me wonder if there's any potential meaning in that. 
The second is that the DLC, which we knew about from the main Nintendo website for the game, was revealed in a DLC roadmap that is going to run all the way towards the end of 2023 with four major patches. It also came with this beautiful artwork with Shulk's replica Monado, Noah's main sword, and Pyra's sword resting together in a field. Very reminiscent of Operation Rainfall's original campaign art to bring games like Xenoblade Chronicles to the West for localization. The DLC is available now to pre-order for 30 US dollars, and while the direct trailer has some detail about it, the main page for the game was also updated with more general information from the roadmap. I mentioned earlier we knew about 25 classes when I really only talked about 23 from the earlier image. Well, that's because two of them will be coming from the DLC in the second and third DLC installments. The brand new story scenario mentioned in the fourth installment is also making me and many others wonder if we are also going to have a new tale unfold a la Torna the Golden Country's story format. It'll be interesting for sure to see all the speculation as to what it could be once the game is finally out and people can throw all their speculation into that. And speaking of speculation, we are finally done speculating and analyzing all that we've gotten from the Xenoblade Chronicles 3 Nintendo Direct trailer with a little bit of info from related sources. This one was an absolute doozy to organize and deal with in getting all the information grouped up nice and neat, but I feel it was more than worth it. If you somehow managed to stick to the very end with me through everything in this video, I thank you very much. But tell me, do you have your own thoughts on anything that I brought up? Or is there something you think that should be interpreted a little differently? Let me know in the comments below. You can also reach out to me on my Twitter where I am far more active on a daily basis. I plan to keep doing Xenoblade videos, so if you enjoy this one, or you just enjoy my content in general, please consider subscribing to my channel, where I'll be sure to make more videos as we get more info on the game, and eventually maybe some videos when the game is actually out. Thank you very much for your time, and as always, have a great day.